In William Shakespeare's tragedy, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet asked the question, what's in a name? In Old Testament times, names had special significance. A person's name often related to the circumstances of their birth, and, and so Moses means drawn from the water. Or a particular characteristic about that person, Esau means hairy one. Or a praise to God, Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. A name also said something about a person's purpose or destiny. And we see this very clearly in Isaiah chapter 9 that Jennifer just read for us. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah had a vision. God pulled back the curtain on the future and gave him a glimpse of the one whose birth would be the fulcrum of history. Jesus' original birth announcement spoken by the prophet comes as a promise of hope in a time of deep darkness and despair for the people of Israel, turning their gaze from the present to the future, to what God was going to do to put the world right and redeem his people. Cast in the form of a song or poem, Isaiah's words are a celebration of joy, hope, and light coming in the midst of darkness. Isaiah 9.1 reads, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Against the dark backdrop of national despair, Isaiah envisions the dawning of the light of salvation, which will result in great joy for God's people. God isn't going to just bring about liberation from foreign oppressors, from the Assyrians, but the complete cessation to war itself. And he's going to do it in a very unexpected way. Verses 6 to 7 read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us, to all the bullies swaggering through history, isn't an even bigger bully, but a baby. His answer is Jesus. And all of the expectations of the throne of David, the hopes and fears of all the years, will be fulfilled in this child. For the baby bundled in the straw holds the universe together. The one nestled in Mary's shoulders bears everything on his shoulders. He is ruler and redeemer of all. Now one of the dangers of this time of year is that we can fail to appreciate the fullness of the one who comes. We can be inoculated, so to speak, by the incarnation, desensitized to the power of its message, and even bored with the baby when we focus on the infant Jesus only. However, as Isaiah tells us, Jesus is far more than just a baby. And wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace are more than just names or titles. They are powerful descriptions of who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. For unto us, these words change Isaiah's vision from a vague, impersonal word to a powerful, personal promise. However, the great truths in this passage will fail to have their full effect on us unless they're personally applied and appropriated. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the names of Jesus in Isaiah 9-6 as a reminder to us of who it is we are watching and waiting for this Advent season. It's my hope that as we reflect on these names, we'll be more prepared to receive Jesus into our hearts anew this Christmas. So this morning, I want to begin by looking at the first name, Wonderful Counselor. Pele, the Hebrew word for wonderful, means marvelous, wonder, miracle, marvel, astonishing, amazing. Marvelous, wonder, miracle, marvel, astonishing, amazing. 
It indicates a phenomenon lying outside of the realm of human explanation, that which is separated from the natural course of events, something unusual, extraordinary, or incredibly great and beyond description. Pele is used almost exclusively in the Old Testament, with the exception of one passage, to describe God's supernatural acts among his people. The Song of Moses, after God gave Israel victory over Pharaoh's army in Exodus 15, 11, is a prime example. <clears throat> Moses sings, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? And indeed, we see God doing wonders throughout the pages of the Old Testament. In our postmodern, scientific, and highly technological age, we tend to have a very low view of the miraculous and, and therefore a limited sense of wonder. And so as Christians, we need to ask ourselves if our sense of wonder goes beyond all human explanation or has science and technology robbed us of our ability to worship a God of wonders, a God of miracles. The prophet Isaiah declared that the coming of Christ would be Pele, that he'd be wonderful in performing marvelous works similar to God in the Old Testament. But Pele doesn't just describe what Jesus does, but also who he is. And Jesus himself is a wonder in five ways. Number one, Jesus is wonderful in his birth. Now, having witnessed three births, I can honestly say that childbirth itself is a miracle. However, the birth of Jesus, what we call the incarnation or in the flesh, is the greatest miracle of all. Think about it. Jesus is the only child to be conceived not with a biological father, but by the Holy Spirit. Luke testifies to this great truth in his account of the Annunciation of the angel Gabriel to Mary. The angel says, And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. Right? There can be no doubt that Jesus is wonderful in his birth. Number two, Jesus is wonderful in his person. Listen to what Paul writes about Jesus in Colossians 1, verses 15 to 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him, and for him. I love that. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In other words, he is the perfect representation of God, reflecting God's divine attributes. If we want to know what God is like, we only need to look to Jesus. Like God, Jesus' love was pure, limitless, and selfless. He wasn't inhibited by the selfish motives of so-called human love. Like God, Jesus was omniscient, all-knowing. He spoke with authority. He knew the thoughts and hearts of those around him. And like God, Jesus was omnipotent, all-powerful. Signs and wonders followed him wherever he went. He turned water into wine, fed thousands with five loaves and two fish, walked on water. Jesus is a wonder in his person. Number three, Jesus is wonderful in his teaching. Jesus stands alone as the world's best scholar, sage, teacher, prophet, and philosopher. At the age of 12, we see him sitting in the temple, listening and asking questions of the religious leaders who were spellbound by him. Luke 2 verses 46 to 47 reads, After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. All four gospel accounts testify to the fact that as an adult, 
Jesus' preaching and teaching was powerful and captivating in a way people had never experienced before. As we read in Matthew 7, 28 to 29, Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Right? Jesus was different. No other teacher or philosopher has ever or will ever be able to say of their teaching what Jesus said about his in Matthew 24, verse 35. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Right? Jesus is wonderful in his teaching. Number four, Jesus is wonderful in his works. John 21 to 25, John 21 verse 25 reads, Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. I love that. John puts that in there at the end of his gospel. It's so easy to just read that and move on. But basically what he's saying is that Jesus did so much more than what I've included here. So much more that, that all the books in the world couldn't contain what Jesus did. Right? When you look at his ministry, when you look at Jesus' signs and wonders, you can clearly see the power of God in action. Jesus controlled the elements of nature by commanding the wind and waves of the stormy sea to obey him and be still. He took authority over the powers of darkness by casting out demons of possessed people and setting them free. In his presence, the blind saw, the lame walked, the deaf heard, even the dead were raised. Never has anyone demonstrated such power. In fact, in John 10, verses 37 to 38, Jesus affirms that these signs and wonders are proof of who he is. He says, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Right? Jesus is wonderful in his works. And, and finally, number five, most importantly, Jesus is wonderful in his death and resurrection. Right? The whole purpose for Jesus' birth, his entire life and ministry, was to die. As Jesus says in Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give up his life a ransom for many. In his death and resurrection, Jesus conquered sin and death and purchased a marvelous salvation for us, liberating us from slavery to sin, reconciling us to God, giving us new life in him. In Jesus' death and resurrection, we are ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. The one whose name is wonderful is himself a wonder. His miraculous birth, precious death, glorious resurrection, his preaching and teaching, signs and wonders all astonish us. Jesus is God's ultimate miracle. As we read in 1 Timothy 3.16, without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. Right? Jesus is indeed wonderful. He is also counselor. Ya'atz, the Hebrew word for counselor, means to advise, deliberate, resolve, consult, counsel, guide, or determine. Let me say that again. To advise, deliberate, resolve, consult, counsel, guide, or determine. Long before Jesus was born, long before the Son was given, Isaiah foretold that God was planning to send a counselor to bind up the brokenhearted people of the world. As we read in Isaiah 11, verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, the Bible places a high premium on wisdom and on wise counsel. Proverbs 1.5 reads, Let the wise hear and increase in learning. 
and the one who understands obtain guidance. In Psalm 33, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. When scripture refers to Jesus as wonderful counselor, it doesn't mean that he's just good at giving advice. Jesus isn't Dr. Phil. It means he understands things that are beyond the ability of our finite minds to understand. Jesus knows things that only God knows. He knows the ways of God. He understands God's plans and purposes. His knowledge, intelligence, wisdom, and insight far exceed that of anyone who has ever lived. Jesus understands the human soul or psyche. First, as co-creator with the Father, right? He made us, as Paul tells us in Colossians 1. But second, as the incarnate Son of God who was fully human and experienced life on earth. Third, as the Redeemer who was without sin and conquered sin and death by dying on the cross and rising to life. And fourth, as the ever-living and ever-present Holy Spirit. Let me give you four reasons why Jesus is wonderful counselor. Number one, he knows our need. He knows our need. A good counselor is someone who is able to rightly identify the problem in the one they're counseling. In order to do this, they usually begin by asking questions or getting the individual to discuss their issues. However, Jesus needs no introduction to our need. He knows us wholly completely, intimately. In fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our heart and he knows our mind. He knows our gifts, talents, and abilities. He knows our sins and weaknesses. He, he knows all about our past, our secret sins, hidden hurts, lost dreams, embarrassing moments. He knows all about our present, our pressures, pains, trials, temptations, worries, and fears. And he knows our future. He knows what's ahead of us, and he alone is able to guide us safely through the landmines and the pitfalls. Jesus knows all about us. As we read in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 4, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. Jesus knows our need. Number two, he understands our struggles. We all have family, friends, or co-workers who tried to counsel us but didn't have any idea what we were going through. The single person providing marriage counseling the newly married couple giving parenting advice, the, the person who's never experienced loss telling you the right, way, the right way to grieve. Being on the receiving end of counsel like this, even when it's well-intentioned, can leave us feeling frustrated because the person has no idea what they're talking about. Unlike these people, however, Jesus gets it. He can relate to us. He knows exactly what we're going through because he's been there. He was fully human and he knows how tough life can get. So we read in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Right? Who in every respect has been tested as we are. Have you ever been betrayed? Jesus has. Have you ever been wrongly accused? Jesus has. Have people ever gossiped about you? Have you ever suffered physical pain? Have you ever felt lonely or afraid? Have you ever suffered loss? Have you ever felt like you've reached the bottom and there's no way up? Jesus has, and he understands. Number three, Jesus is wonderful counselor because he cares for us. He cares for us. First Peter 5, 7 reads, Cast all your burdens on the Lord, for he cares for you. Right? There's a lot of people 
walking around carrying their burdens. When we're called to just cast them on the Lord simply because he cares. Human counselors care for us while we're sitting in front of them. But once we leave, they're focused on the next person, but not Jesus. Right? We're always on his mind. He cares about our whole being, our character, our spiritual growth, our emotional welfare, our, our spiritual health. He cares about our pain and our suffering. He cares about our past, our present and future. He, he doesn't limit us to an hour a week and then leave us to fend for ourselves when our session is over. When we see no way out, when we see no way forward, when we have no idea what to do, when we're lost, lonely, and afraid, when we're stuck in the bottom of the pit, Jesus steps in with this promise from Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Instead of walking around weary, instead of carrying around our burdens, we need to bring them to Jesus. And we need to find rest. Lastly, Jesus is wonderful counselor because he embodies wisdom. He embodies wisdom. Now, I have benefited greatly from professional counselors and therapists and from the advice of godly men and women. However, as wonderful counselor, Jesus can not only diagnose our problem, he knows exactly what to do about it. He knows the fix. He has the prescription. Job 12, 13 reads, To God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. And Proverbs 2, 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Both of these passages affirm that the source of all true wisdom is God. And this wisdom is communicated to us most fully in Jesus. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 23 to 24, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus doesn't just reveal the wisdom of God to us. He is the wisdom of God. It's by Jesus that we know what God looks like and how we can know him more. It's by Jesus that we know what God expects from us. It's by Jesus that we know how to live and how to relate to each other. It's by Jesus that we know what's best for us. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And how do we receive the guidance of our wonderful counselor for the specific issues we're dealing with? Well, first and foremost, through the Bible. Through the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 105 reads, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, the Bible, like a street light on a dark night, can show us the correct way forward. And so we need to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. This takes time and effort every day. However, if we're willing to commit to the Bible, if we're willing to be intentional about reading it, if we're willing to do the digging, God's wisdom will be there for us. So we receive the the guidance of our wonderful counselor through the Bible, and secondly, through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. This requires prayer and discernment. Prayer and discernment. What I mean by that is, as we seek the Lord's guidance regarding an issue, as we read scripture, as we pray, as we uh, bring it to godly people for their advice and counsel, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and minds to give us the wisdom and the insight we need. Now, this doesn't always come quickly. 
Right? Sometimes, as Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7, we need to continue asking, continue seeking, and continue knocking. We live in an age where so many people are anxious, confused, discouraged, frustrated, fearful, and hopeless. Everywhere, people are seeking answers and looking for guidance and direction. And in the midst of all of this seeking, there's an equal number of people claiming to have all the answers, calling out to us, listen to me, follow me. It's no wonder society has become so polarized and divided into different philosophical and political camps. It's, it's no wonder people are so lost and confused. Thankfully, God wants to reveal his will to us. He doesn't intend for us to grope around in the dark looking in vain for guidance or help. Nor does he intend for us to seek wisdom and insight from the world. Jesus, our wonderful counselor, is the one we've been looking for all our lives. He's the one who understands when no, no one else does. He's the one who stands by us when everyone else turns away. He is the one who can really help us confront the past in order to find freedom in the present and new life in the future. In Jesus, we have someone who, by virtue of his infinite wisdom and understanding, is qualified to guide and direct our lives. Someone who is never confused or mistaken. Someone who always knows exactly what to do. Someone who knows what's best for us and will never lead us astray. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is Jesus my wonderful counselor? Do I really see him as someone who understands better than anyone else what life is all about? Do I go to him first for assistance in dealing with life's problems? Or do I look to the advice of family, friends, a professional, or the author of the latest bestseller and, and then go to Jesus as a last resort? Maybe it's time to stop running and to listen to the wonderful counselor. Maybe it's time to stop hiding from the things that haunt your life and take your hurts, fears, and failures to him. If we look to him and place our trust in him, we will find that his counsel is the only counsel we'll need and the best we could ever find. What's in a name? Juliet asks. Only everything that we needed to be brought back into relationship with God. What's in a name? A salvation that lasts forever. A love that can be never fully understood. A life that's forever changed. A power that can accomplish more than we can ask or imagine. A message that's eternal. And a gift that's waiting for the world to open. As we uh, move forward in this season of Advent, we join our voices with the voices of Christians throughout the world and indeed throughout history as we proclaim Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come quickly.